So much of my work is about telling a new narrative. Getting here on this planet um, was challenging. My, um, my mom, she was mentally ill, and I was one of seven children that she had. She was from Texas, and she suffered at the hands of a very racist and brutal uh, mental health system. And she had me in Oakland, California, in West Oakland, California. And all of us were doled out in separate court cases. And I bounced around in, in group homes until I was about 22 months old. But I had the privilege, and I think about privilege in many different ways and how it shows up, the luck of finding a family who took me in at 22 months old and it changed my life forever. So much of the professional is personal. And I wanna share a story with you about how that came to be for me. So I do have a PowerPoint. We can just go ahead and dim the lights. <laughs> so this is the family that took me in. This is the, and this is me at the bottom with a big ribbon in my hair. Um, and this is uh, the Levias family. Um, they actually were um, about 50 years old when I came into their life. They had already raised their children. And this is my dad who um, was retiring. And this was a piece of land, on a piece of land where this, this event happened in Lake County, California. So these were folks who came to California in the 40s in search of the warmth of other suns. They came to escape uh, the terror of Jim Crow and to embrace the economic opportunities newly available to African Americans in the North and in the West Coast. And they took the train and worked in the Kaiser shipyards and, and really you know, built a, a whole new life for themselves. But they brought with them this love for nature and the outdoors. So up in Lake County, we had a ranch. That ranch had cows and pigs, and, and it was a place of real refuge for me as a young girl. And I was able to be there almost every other weekend with my dad, my mom, and ride my bike on those country roads and really appreciate the evolution of a tadpole into a frog, to really see the stars at night that I I wasn't able to see in a light polluted sky in the Bay Area. But not only was it a place for me to learn about nature and the outdoors, how to hunt, how to fish, how to can, how to, how to garden, but it was also a place of hospitality. Anybody could come to this ranch, I mean anybody, like the car dealer that my dad dealt with, could knock on the door at any time and be welcomed in. And <laughs> not much longer after coming in the door, have a hot plate of food in front of them. My, my dad had this, this saying, he says, you know, you have a standing invitation. You get invited once, and you don't have to be invited ever again. So hospitality, and also understanding and witnessing the wonder of adults in nature was something that stuck with me uh, throughout my life. I also love to write. From a young age, I kept diaries. This is, these are actually two pages from my Hello Kitty diary. <laughs> Big loopy, learning to write cursive. Of me describing my first camping experience at Hidden Villa Ranch with the Girl Scouts. <laughs> Writing the lyrics to the songs we sang. And even though my parents love the outdoors, they really didn't quite understand why I'd want to go camping, right? Because that really was a very different cultural experience for them. But I wanted to be around kids my age. As I mentioned earlier, my parents were much older. And I, I really embraced the chance to be with young people in the Girl Scouts and in other programs offered to me in the Bay Area. Here's another constant. Does anyone want to date themselves? <laughs> and tell me what this is. You can yell it out. 
Okay. I heard word processor. Actually, it's uh, the first, uh, one of the first home computers that you could get. I was uh, going from elementary school to, to middle school, and we had Commodore computers in our classroom. And I wanted the home version, and my parents were generous to give me um, the home version that you plugged up into a television that became your monitor, and it was all coding. So from a very young age, I was not only in connecting in nature, writing about nature, but also using the technology of the day. And I was also on the World Wide Web, connecting in at the speed of 14.4 baud. <laughs> See, now you want to date yourself. Um, and, 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 find, and use those technologies to find other people to connect with and to get outside with. And I found this organization through my research called Outward Bound. And I said, I looked at the pictures, I sent away for a brochure, and it looked like those people were having a great time. So I thought I'd try too. Now, I had no mountaineering experience. Lots of experience in the outdoors, no rock climbing experience, no backpacking experience. And to prepare for the trip, we had a very long list of things that we had to bring. I was about 20 years old, not a lot of money, living on my own by then, and I was trying to cut some corners. So I decided, well, I don't need a headlamp and a flashlight. Well, I did need a headlamp because you, you need your hands for climbing, especially when you're climbing at night. And so we, uh, after a day of, of climbing and practicing, we uh, were going to climb in the evening to camp at the summit. And it was decided that I had to go first, because I didn't have a flash or a headlamp. I wanted to use the light that was available. And about halfway up, because I was painfully slow, the light disappeared on the other side of the mountain. And I couldn't see anymore. And I was literally starfished on the side of that mountain terrified, crying, didn't think I could go any further. But the instructor leaned over and said three words that I'll never forget. He said, Rue, trust your feet. And th that, that combination of words unlocked something within me that helped me to scramble to the top without seeing what was ahead of me or even seeing what was below me. And I'll tell you, I've been trusting my feet ever since. Because sometimes I don't know what just happened. Or I don't know what's ahead. But I know that I can dig in. And that was the moment at the precipice of adulthood that I got the lesson I needed to get. That I had what was in me to move forward. And so it wasn't until maybe a decade or more later I found myself after marriage, three children, had returned back to school to figure out my life. I had a conversation at the crossroads with a mentor who asked me a question I think everyone should ask or answer. She knew I was considering going to business school. She knew that hauling my three little kids to business school was going to be really challenging. So she said, Rue, you know, if time and money were not an issue, what would you be doing? And I opened my mouth, and my life fell out. <laughs> I said, oh, I would probably start a website to reconnect African Americans to the outdoors. <laughs> and it surprised us both, because it was a moment where my truth was unlocked like a key in the door. All the experiences that I had had, all that I had been blessed with growing up in the family that taught me about nature, how I loved technology, how I sought the use of technology to help me find others, came into focus. And Outdoor Afro was born. <laughs> and it was, it was a simple blogger template. Nothing fancy, no focus groups. Um, it was just me telling the story of loving the outdoors and nature in the way that I'm sharing with you today. And social media was very new uh, when this came out. 
there really wasn't a Twitter. Twitter was an odd thing that people hadn't quite figured out. Most people were not yet on Facebook. There was no Instagram. So as a result of using this platform, this new platform, that people hadn't quite figured out how to professionalize, the algorithms were flat, and I was able from my kitchen table to have a conversation with people about the things that I cared about in nature. And what surprised me was that there were people out there who thought, like me, that they were the only ones, or that they were a rarity. There were African American women between the ages of 35 and 44 who were not in focus. We were not in the pages of Backpacker magazine. We were not featured as having a relationship and joy in the outdoors. So I had studied art history at UC Berkeley and came to appreciate through that experience the power of visual representation and realized we had a visual representation problem. So having <coughs> access to the internet, I was able to tell a different story. A story about not why don't, but how we do. And I've never looked back. And I had the privilege, let's see, great. I had the privilege of partnering with folks in the very beginning. Folks who were grappling with slightly different take on the challenge, not the representation challenge, but who might be our future conservationists? Who might be our future customers? I mean, REI back then was looking at a membership base of predominantly white males over 50. You know, I had the privilege also around that time to work at Golden Gate Audubon Society, where I learned I fell in love with birds all over again. And they too were looking at their member roles, their member roles that didn't look like a sustainable future for those organizations. So we took the time back then to learn a lot from each other. And I learned about what leadership in the outdoors could look like. And I also showed them what leadership in the outdoors looked like based on the experiences that I had growing up. I also took the time to, oh, that's me and uh, Jerry Strisky, who's the CEO of REI. Um, we've had a lot of wonderful experiences over time getting to know each other. And they've been tremendously supportive of our work but I also took the time to poll folks and find out what were some of the reasons that you're not getting outdoors? What are some of the barriers? Gear and equipment, super challenging for most people. Um, and you look at the price tags of some of these things. People don't understand why would you make those, those kinds of investments? Or what might you already have in your closet that you don't need to repurchase? Fears and perceptions were very big. Not only fears of things that would crawl on you or bite you, but fears of other people. Transportation, sometimes it's so close but so far away. I mean, how might a child in East Oakland have access to a beautiful place like Point Reyes without transportation? And then finally, stress. How do we fit the outdoors in an already stressed life? or where there's a hierarchy of needs, where people are thinking about food security, or they're thinking about uh, public safety. How do we fit the outdoors in already impacted lives? So we decided to become more than a blog and create relevant outdoor experiences informed by those challenges and designed to flatten those barriers. And I went right back to the internet went back to social media, and back to Lake County. And I asked who would want to join me in helping lower barriers for other people. And about 12 brave souls said yes. People I hadn't even met who responded to the simple criteria of being an outdoor Afro leader. And we set about around the country helping people to get their nature swagger back, <laughs> to, to help connect with backyard nature through all kinds of outdoor recreational activities. And we grew the team slightly. Um, I'm really proud to say that our second year of training was right here, um, here in West Marin. And uh, it was wonderful to fly in people from around the country to, this is the Marconi Conference Center, um, to 
to get a taste of California. And we took the time to teach people about risk management, conservation ethic, and all the ways that we could communicate using the digital tools of the day uh, for this work. We decided to double. This is at the National Conservation Training Center uh, back in 2015, and then doubled again in Yosemite a couple years ago. And this is, uh-oh. Here we go. Oh, we missed a slide. I'm missing a slide of my current team. Ah! <laughs> Ah, well, I have to say that we're about to bring in another group of 80 people from around the country. And we now, thank you. And we now are, are in 29 states and connecting with over 30,000 people. Thank you. But I decided to go back to that capital W wilderness again. Uh, and I had the privilege of connecting in with the Sierra Club. There's Mike Bruhn and some of our friends uh, and outfitters uh, who came along with us. And this is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I can't describe um, how vast and beautiful this place is. And um, just soon after arriving, we had this visitor in our camp. And I was terrified, y'all. <laughs> Don't be fooled by how cute this picture is, okay? Because here it is, you know, um, I'm from Oakland. <laughs> and, um, and we were confronted with this bear who would actually uh, had followed this this biblical number of porcupine caribou. We were all in awe about this, this, this amazing wildlife. And there pops up the bear. And we did what humans like to do with um, charismatic megafauna. We like to uh, reason with it. Um, Go away, bear. You don't want to be here, bear. Uh, we knew not to run, but we sure were heavy on the reason. And this bear was really confused by us. And, and definitely wasn't one of those Yosemite bears who knows how to open coolers and car doors and had probably had very little, if any, exposure to humans. And as fast as he arrived, he took a whiff of northern air and disappeared into the landscape behind that herd of caribou. And I, as my knees were trembling, I realized that, you know, <laughs> If we were enjoyed as takeout that day, that that wild was resilient and strong and would continue to lumber on without regard for its human passengers. We were in that bear's wild. We were not at the top of the food chain. That hard reset on my humanity left me a better person. But I wondered about how that wild connected in to East Oakland. I mean, this is how people are connecting to their outdoors, their wild. These are the scraper bike kings who put together these beautiful um, bikes and, and go around and, and help inspire people to embrace cycling. These are people who would never you know, necessarily have the privilege that I did to connect in with the refuge. So how did it all connect? And then I also you know, ask questions about how might we tap into the history of African Americans who absolutely have always had a connection to nature and to tell different stories. You know, I think often about Harriet Tubman. She was a wilderness leader, y'all, okay? How did she manage to get people in the cover of night to freedom. She didn't have a GPS. She didn't have the fancy shoes from REI. What can we learn from her? Or people like George Washington Carver, who innovated um, you know, gardening and, and technology using the peanut. But we also have other stories that we have to find atonement for, because um, bad things have happened to black people in the woods. 
If you listen to the lyrics of Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, she is talking about black bodies hanging from trees. And we have a living primary source generation who know exactly what we're talking about and who are telling their offspring, their children, their grandchildren, that the wild, that nature is not a safe place for black bodies. So it, it really makes a lot of sense for me in the work of Outdoor Afro that people want to get out in nature, but they like to do it in groups, okay? They feel safer that way. I see the picture of the single person standing over the sweeping vista. That's not a safe image for a lot of African Americans. So being out in groups is so important. And the opportunity exists today for Outdoor Afro and organizations like ours to tell a new narrative. There's also the reality today that the outdoors can represent violence in the urban area on black bodies. And this is a scene that was repeated all over the country around the time that Ferguson's um, tragedy came out in the news. People were in despair. They didn't know what to do. So they took to the streets. And I was leaving my office at the moment when Oakland was bracing for riots. And the helicopters had already been deployed. And I'm walking to my car and asking myself, well, what is, you know, what's my role in this? What does Outdoor Afro do in a time like this? And the answer came. And it was like, Rue, you do nature. That's your lane. So I was led to get on the phone and call outdoor Afro leaders and partners and say, you know what, we're going to go do healing hikes. And about 30 people came and joined us in the Oakland Hills in a clearing. We started with setting some intentions and doing some yoga and breathing exercises. And we wound our way down the trail into that Redwood Bowl. And something amazing happened. We were listening to each other. You know, that, the trees, that forest was able to absorb the excess of our emotions and help us to see each other. And as we got down to the bottom of that trail, down to the stream trail, I realized we were doing what African Americans have always known that we could do and that was to lay down our burdens down by the riverside. And that was the epiphany and experience that caused me to understand the power of nature as a healer. And we've been doing healing hikes ever since for national tragedies, but also to heal as a community and as individuals. And I'm just gonna run through what the experience looks like, what this new narrative looks like of Outdoor Afro. It's about healing. It's about backyard nature. This is Chicago, skyscrapers in the back and kayaks in the front. It's about teaching, teaching our young people how to swim. We have a, a public health crisis right now of a disproportionate number of African Americans who drowned because they were not taught to swim because they were not allowed in public pools and in coastal areas. So we wanna, we wanna get people swimming and living again. We also, because we've built trust in our community, we have people who want to try more adventurous activities like whitewater rafting, camping. We also help families learn how to get out with their young people. One important value to Outdoor Afro is really helping to restore outdoor leadership back to the home. And remembering wonder this gentleman's about 35 years old, but if you look at that face, <laughs> holding that banana slug, he's like four years old again. 
So while we focus a lot on kids, adults need nature and wonder too. And this is the face of Barbara and her daughter Jalea from Richmond experiencing snow in the Sierras for the very first time. And sometimes we do more adventurous things. This is outdoor Afro leaders who summited Mount Whitney. And uh, I'm proud to share that they're going to be headed to Tanzania uh, to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in June. So really embracing the full range of what outdoor experiences can look like, both locally and globally. And then conservation ethic is woven into everything we do. However, the practice of actually getting out and putting our hands on the land is something that we like to do after we've cultivated a relationship with those places. When I see children out picking up plastic and cigarette butts from a beach, my first question is, have they played here before? So we want to make sure that we're not having people come out into nature to work, but that this is, this is about love, this is about relationship, and it's a long game. And sometimes it's about just getting around a fire and doing what humans have done through time immemorial to tell our story around a warm fire. So we've learned a few things. Um, I'll close here with this and a very short video to give you more insight about what the outdoor Afro leaders are about in their own words. But relevance is everything. You know, we cannot force our perspective, our perspective and worldview on others, believing that it's the right thing to do. We have to meet people really where they are and build on those things that, they're, that are of value to them. And the secret sauce of Outdoor Afro, and I think for the kind of change we want to see, is leadership. It's not enough just to have people on the programmatic side, but we've got to have our boards looking different. We've got to have our C-suite looking different, the people who can actually steer the ship of organizations. Um, um, and also, finally, is this about the long view? The change that we're engaged with right now and we want to see is not going to happen within a grant year. <laughs> you know, I think a lot about smoking, right? In my, when I was little, you could smoke everywhere. Trains, banks, everywhere. But now, you can't anywhere. It was, but it wasn't one thing. It was levers and pulleys and policies and PR. It was a whole bunch of folks who were involved. And I think that this is our big moment to figure out where we fit in the shift that will be generational. So what will success look like? Well, for me, it will look like we are you know, out in nature and we see people enjoying it in proportion to their population and their opportunity, and it's no big deal. So, thank you. Thank you.